Thank you, Brendan. Oh, it's very kind of you, an elaborate introduction. <coughs> Just to say clearly, I'm Jerusha, and this is John. We come to studying China from long academic careers. I was at UCD for 30 years. Uh, John Blair was at the University of Geneva for 30 years. Uh, we're both teaching American studies. And uh, because uh, we were already importing what was quite a foreign culture in the 70s into Europe. Uh, but we learned from that uh, that you had to explain a great deal, even though the Atlantic, once we got to China, looked like a puddle. You know? But we had to explain quite a lot about American culture to Europeans. And when we decided to go to China together on retirement, uh, we discovered, uh, well, it was like falling off the edge of the world. I mean, everything was different. It was quite shocking. Uh, John Blair had been there before in 1988. He was able to guide me through it, or I think I would have packed up and left in two months. Uh, but <laughs> so we uh, taught a course, invented a course, really, for our university, which is called Beijing Studies, Foreign Studies University. Uh, an elite uh, university, small, teaches every language known in the EU, including Irish, by the way, now. Um, and it also prepares the diplomats and foreign service personnel. We taught in the <coughs> School of International Studies and English, thankfully in English, uh, to the best reputedly the best 200 English speakers in China. Well, it was actually 220 in our class. And uh, the first discovery was we could not teach Western civilization there. It was so weird. It was so strange. And particularly since the Chinese students didn't know their own culture. as partly the result of history, the Cultural Revolution, but they had been deprived. We knew more about Confucius and Zhuangzi than they did. You know, so it was a bit like teaching French to people who didn't know what a preposition was in English or a participle. You know, you had to begin where they began. So we teach um, through Chinese culture. We decided to make this our project over 3,000 years, a comparative course. And it's a small order. <laughs> Initially, the course was one year, then it was reduced to one semester. So if we're given to large generalizations, you understand why. Uh, two huge civilizations, if you call it the West and China, over 3,000 years. Uh, but we did see very clear patterns in both. We saw them because we had to make them the stepping stones to get from one to the other. So we were quite clear what we could teach and what we couldn't teach. There's some things you only learn and very painfully, like the language. <laughs> there are other things like uh, the concepts and the divides. So uh, we also t decided... After the first year that, and when John Blair taught the course and I sat in the back, I didn't quite heckle, but I prepared a critique, <laughs> which on Friday morning was delivered over breakfast. So he very clearly took the advice of Machiavell and keep your enemies close and <laughs> asked me to teach with him. So we then teach comparatively, which leads another view because we don't think quite differently um, in many ways. So I'm going to hand it over to John. If there's a lot of back and forth, it's because yeah, we have a slideshow in which we um, I, we teach. You have a screen there, too. I don't know yes, where so you I can see that. that. Okay. Right. okay. Right. So this is the cover of a book uh, published in the United States in 2013. It's the American edition of this Chinese book published in Shanghai by Fudan University Press. That's the third edition. These are the readings from the last 3,000 years or so in the West and in China. And, of course, according to us, if you want to study these civilizations, we want you to buy our book. Uh, what we're going to d distill for you in, in over rapid fashion is what we've come to understand in this process of spending part of every year in the last dozen years in China, teaching, lecturing, uh, and so on. Many of you have been to China already. You will have your own basis of experience and knowledge to test our generalizations, but uh, let's give it a try. So, it's misunderstanding China, as Brendan says, uh, cultural barriers, which we think are major, and there we think the, the usual Western responses to these barriers are, are not helpful, and we wouldn't want to suggest how it might be done better, uh, and you see what you think. So how is it that the West doesn't understand China? Um, the usual, there are more than 200 books in English published every year, these, these, these years, about China, two, two to 300 of them. And most of them approach China using Western categories uh, rather than Chinese ones. Obviously, we, we think that's a poor idea because it creates uh, something we call uh, an echo chamber. If you try to understand China through Western modalities, 
Here's what happens. You take information, quantification, causation studies. That's what we've learned how to do well in the West. And you try to make them work on China. You discover that it doesn't. Because the information is not readily available or it's skewed for various Chinese reasons. And you cannot possibly understand China in terms of a single cause for any event. If you ask Western questions, you're likely to find China lacking. Uh, that is, China's not the West. Simple as that. But the books keep coming out that say China ought to become like the West as quickly as possible so we can get on with business as usual. That's not going to happen. Uh, the echo chamber effect is our phrase for trying to see China as Western or approach China in Western terms. Uh, it does not recognize the specificities of China, and hence any negotiation, any collaboration, for example, with the climate crisis that's on us now, are not going to succeed. So another specific reason why the West doesn't understand China is because we, most of us, believe in universal laws and principles. Uh, the, the, we're going to talk about some of them, key words that keep being repeated in Western discourse, like democracy, equality, freedom, science, causation, all of them. Uh, they do not apply in China. That is, they can be learned by Chinese as part of what they learn in school, but they do not grow out of Chinese culture. They're part of Western civilization, not natively part of Chinese civilization, according to us. So the West, as we view it after this, uh, these years of trying to compare the civilizations, is primarily shaped by Judeo-Christianity. Maybe that's controversial, I don't know. Uh, if you, like many Westerners, many Irish people, feel you are living in a post-Catholic world or a post-Christian world or a humanist world, uh, you have every right to categorize your worldview as you choose. But according to us, all <coughs> of the worldviews common in the West are based fundamentally on Judeo-Christianity, even for people who now consider themselves to be atheists. And we'll discuss that if you want to ask about it. Uh, it makes a big difference because in the Chinese world, the, uh, as you'll see, there, uh, these things do not apply. The West operates from first principles. That is, uh, Plato got us started talking about ideal forms, and people still talk about ideals, the things that ought to be. The rule of law, the rule of law, is the Western way of putting it. If the Chinese use the term at all, it will be a rule of law. What's the difference? A rule of law implies there could be several different versions of rules of law that would apply. But if you have the rule of law, there's only one. And that's usually understood to be us, our particular version of that. And the universal laws don't extend to China. Uh, many of you know the American Declaration of Independence, famous Western political document. It begins, we hold these truths to be self-evident. In China, there are no self-evident truths. Uh, there are some observations about the nature of things which are widely held. Uh, for example, everything changes and everything is connected. But that gives you a modality for coping with the world, not for deciding how people should believe about it. Uh, so there are no self-evident truths in, this case, in the Chinese world. Therefore, obviously, Western authority systems that we're used to in politics and business and elsewhere are ra radically different from what works in the Chinese world. So our goal then is to try to uh, explain better the, uh, what happens in China. Here's Michelangelo. Yeah, this is a summary in a nutshell of what we don't understand about China. Um, there is no creator God. Obviously that comes to us from our Judeo-Christian and even from the Greek myths. There's no creator God. What does that imply? Who creates you then? Your parents. All the kind of, 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 of reverence we Christians have for God is transferred onto the parents. They are the ones who made you, to the extent that Confucius said you should not even, uh, you cannot do anything to your body, for instance, uh, pierce it, have tattoos, because your body belongs to your parents. Now that's Confucian in traditional teaching. Uh, it led the eunuchs, for instance, to preserve those bodily parts which were taken away in Mercury so they could be buried with them. It, it leads now to a, a resistance to organ transplants. Uh, so your parents, you reverence, and all the ancestors before who gave you life, you would not be here except for the millennium of ancestors before you. You have no eternal essence or immortality. You have no self or soul that is not given to you, in this case by others. What does that mean? Your immortality rests with your children, your ability to prolong the family 
And in this case, uh, for China, it's the one child, which is one reason why so much weight is put on that child, so much pressure on that child. That is the family's immortality. That is their prolongation through millennia. Um, so, I, and also, of course, longevity is very important. There's, in other words, no independent transcendental world. There is a kind of vague realm of spirits, you know, and ghosts and so forth, but it is not, as we see it in Judeo-Christian, it is not a city of God. There is not a civil service of angels up there, you know, and so forth and so on. The sort of, um, you know, world that Milton describes in Paradise Lost. There's not a one world in of stable first principles you can appeal to. The famous painting of Raphael in the stanza of Plato pointing upwards to truth. So, uh, you know, we uh, when we teach this, uh, people look at us if we start to teach the history of Christianity. We have to do it through vision. Uh, visual things we usually do to the Sistine Chapel. In the end, uh, you know, this makes China sound very weird. But when you're in China, actually, it's the West that seems very weird. Believe me, when you when you're suddenly in a world in which these things are not automatic beliefs, you wonder, well, how are you? You have, you're totally disoriented. Um, so that. This is the outcome of this. Why is why do we think of China as weird? In fact, since uh, the reorder of the reordering of the world over the last ten or twenty years, in which the rise of China, uh, vis- increasing visibility of the rest of the world, one of the things that has been evident through investigation, in this case by social psychologists, <coughs> is it is not the rest of the world that is weird. Oh, uh, it is in fact the West. The West is very particular in many fields. Now, I'm going to cite you. It's on a handout you have. It's the uh, third item there. Or is it the third? I don't have have an outdated handout. I have an outdated handout. Sorry. Sorry, we don't have it on the handout. Uh, We will get it. We will post it on the website. Right. Right. Um, It is a... a, um, This is weird. Mm -hmm. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. There are very few countries in the world that have all those qualities, right? Uh, some are rich but not democratic, some are educated but not industrialized, and so forth. So the West, in fact, according to these sociologists, there are um, three social scientists that made a study. It came out in 2010, very recently. It's taken off in terms of the annals of reading about the West, says that in these domains, now I'll list them, they were able through big data for the first time to look at huge studies in social psychology across all sorts of civilizations. One was an anthropologist (coughs) working in small civilizations. And they thought the following domains are in contest. Uh, The concept of fairness, the concept of equality, concept of cooperation, spatial reasoning, Categorization and inferential reasoning, we'll see that in a minute, how people form categories. Moral reasoning, very different in the rest of the world. Reasoning styles, very different in the rest of the world. Self-concepts and related motivations about who you are and what you want out of the world. And visual perception. So the rest of the world, in contrast to the West, sees the world literally very differently. And uh, this can be established, as I say, through psychological tests. Now, I'm going to give you one test, which has been given widely, in this case, by an American <coughs> who is cited here, uh, Richard Nisbet, a very <coughs> in, interesting um, thinker, a social psychologist called The Geography of Thought. Um, and uh, the conclusion of these Western ways are, cannot be privileged <coughs> to the rest of the world because traditional Asian ways, which China shares with the rest of the world, most of the traditional Asian ways of thinking and acting. So, in fact, it is not China that is weird <coughs> at all. It is we in the West who are most particular. But the difficulty is, of course, as others aim to become rich, say, in Brazil, in Mexico, or in China, uh, that we also think they're going to become weird, that is, democratic. And that isn't necessarily so. The two do not follow. Um, now, I'm going to give you a test to show you how one arrives at these presumptions, and I'm going way back to when you were four, uh, if you can remember that far back, some of you. This is a test that was given by Richard Nisbet to four-year-olds in America, a wide variety of them. Uh, uh, one group of Americans, one group of uh, Asian children, and one group of Asian American children. And because they were only four and could not read, he had to show them pictures. 
So he showed them four pictures, one of hen, one of cow, one of grass, and he said to them, please tell us one by one which two belong most comfortably together. So I'm going to try it here. Okay, friends, uh, which two belong more comfortably together? Does the hen belong to the grass? How many would vote for that? No, no takers. No take. Does the hen and the cow belong? Is exclusively just one link? Or just one link, one link. I mean, just or if you had to put the two together okay. in one go, which would it, would you put the hen and the cow together? Okay, there's one person. <laughs> and who would put the cow in the grass? Well, gosh, I know you're Irish. <laughs> we all know cows eat grass in America. They don't know that anymore. They keep them in barns, you know. <laughs> the lost art. Well, what he discovered, of course, was the Western, and then we only have one Westerner here, fully acculturated. First of all, he discovered you must realize by age four you're fully a member of your culture. You will not change in the way you think. You can think in the other way, but you're uh, effectively in culture. The Western way of thinking, immediately, the four year olds, this is amazing had an invisible concept up there in the cloud called the animal. Now, none of us have seen an animal, right? It doesn't exist. We've only seen instances of animals, right? In this case, a cow and a hen, right? So the Western children were terribly sophisticated in their reasoning. That's very interesting. This <coughs> transcendental world is being built by four-year-olds. This cathedral we carry around with us of first principles and ideas and categories, all in hierarchies. Whereas the Chinese uh, and the Asian children saw them and uh, saw things. Sorry, um, where is that graphic? It's not coming up. Okay, what is wrong with this? Okay, okay. What I want to do uh, is show you a circle which should have been there, and I don't know where it's gone. Um, of the cow eating the grass, producing milk, which feeds more cows. You all know this circle. You all. Uh, Irish, there are twice as many cows there are people in Ireland. Why shouldn't we know this, you know? But in other words, it goes way back to learning the mother tongue, and language is a key here. When mothers teach words to the children in the West, mothers tend to sit the children on their knee or point to things, look, a car, look, a bus. You know, they both transport or machines or whatever, right? They enforce that grouping through categories, and they point to objects and nouns. Or, that is a teddy, hand mummy the teddy. Whereas Asian um, parents from East Asian, mothers in particular, also grandparents, reinforce relationships. They don't care whether it's a teddy bear or a toy truck. Give to mummy, I give to you. They teach verbs. They teach exchange. And here's a picture that maybe is, speaks more than the words. The Western mother trying to teach her baby to read at maybe you know, six, eight, nine months. You know, um, uh, look at the distance. Uh, she's holding up an object, trying to teach him with his head and his eyes, not with his body. Whereas the Chinese mother here is hugging her child. You give the flower to mummy, I give to you. You know, back and forth. What is the emphasis there? A world of nouns versus a verb and noun. We live in a world of objects and nouns versus a world of verbs. So we have cultural divides here that are very large from a very early age. So this slide just tries to summarize uh, what's been implicit in our focus on acculturation, which is a kind of a, <clears throat> an anthropological emphasis. How do cultures get passed along without changing very much from one generation to the other in China and the West, even though there are enormous numbers of changes going on in the world, in governance and economics and so on, the mentalities don't change that fast. So the Western world is focused on categories, principles, oriented to systems, very detailed and very abstract. <clears throat> and children learn to get along because uh, they, they want to talk with us, their parents. And we call on transcendental universal values because maybe because we've had centuries of the West dominating the rest of the world, coming to believe that the way the West does things is automatically the best for all human beings. Highly doubtful, uh, but uh, in any case, a common assumption on the part of Western people. And finally, if there are hierarchies involved, we so emphasize the notion of equality that the hierarchies are in the other world, uh, the transcendental world. In China, quite the opposite. It is oriented to this world, that the values is fo are focused on relationships in context, very concrete values. There are 
uh, pointing to more and more complex interactions between people, families, clans, villages, ultimately a nation. And finally, there are many hierarchies, but they're in this world, not in some other world. So if you take that, those fundamental cultural differences in orientation, you begin to think about governance. Uh, this is the way Western governance seems to work for most countries today. It presumes belief in first principles, and some of them are words that we are familiar with already. They're the language that represents them, and they, these are Judeo-Christian in origin as articulated through the Enlightenment a couple of centuries ago, and the key words, you all know them. I think you probably use them. Democracy, equality, freedom, individualism. There are others. Science, rationality, reason, and so on. And in our world, debate and confrontation is considered constructive because individuals are competing with each other to define what is true or worth believing. In the Chinese world, confrontation is destructive because it challenges the solidarity which is presumed to be most important to be maintained. <clears throat> so uh, in the West, it's okay to, to confront and have differences of opinion because it's an impersonal process. It is a principle process. It is debate, is our standard word for it. Uh, debate is very difficult for the Chinese, and if there's time after... Do you want to tell the example. Chinese professor's story about disagreeing with him publicly? And uh, which is I, I think the story about, about your teaching your class how to debate is, oh, is more perfect. Okay, well, I had to teach my class to how to debate. It was very, very difficult. You're, because, you're now both debating. So oh, yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who, we who, want to, right. Who's going to give the example? Uh, right, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, they, uh, they didn't want to debate because they would lose face if they disagreed with each other publicly in the class. I want to teach them. It was called critical thinking. That's how we think critically. Um, and they were even more concerned when I said, I'll give you a controversial topic, but you won't be free to say whether you're going to debate for or against it. I'm going to throw a coin. You prepare both sides and be prepared. And in the end, they said that's not acceptable. You know, so I had to, I said, okay, I divided the room up and I said, next, uh, next class, you're going to debate, uh, and the proposition was uh, China's becoming too westernized, right? Mm -hmm. So I sent them away and said, prepare a pro, you prepare a con, off you go. And two days later we met up and the debate went as smooth as cream. I mean, you know, they were, they, they were all very polite to each other, they were all so forth and so on. I said, what's going on? Mm -hmm. I took the class monitor aside, oh, we prepared this. <laughs> they rigged the whole meeting, right? Because they didn't want to disagree with each other. But then, I, then, 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 when I got them beneath the formal debate, there was almost blood on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it is clear that it, it, you know the trouble is that if you disagree with people in China, it's true here too. If you disagree with people, you they lose face or respect. If you say, I learned never uh, after a talk if I was asked to comment on a talk, as you often are in academic circles, to say, um, you know, what Professor Wong said is very uh, interesting. Um, but I think I would take him up on two or three points here. And uh, you never say that. What you say is he's very interesting, but maybe I'd like to supplement it with a few observations. <laughs> you never disagree with a Chinese person. And I'm sure, as I say, that Ireland's very much the same. So, so our idea of... Let's see, why, why is this not working? Our assumptions about governance in China uh, is that it is highly centralized and top-down, which of course it is, uh, but we assume that that means it's inflexible. That's wrong. It's extremely flexible. It is in constant negotiation on different levels, uh, and it's very complicated, especially for outsiders. It does depend on being respectful towards superiors. This is xia, uh, the, the respect within the family and beyond the family that is probably the most widespread and important continuing value in Chinese life. Therefore, we assume that the authorities are in control. Uh, and control means suppression and repression, and indeed uh, citizens have few ways to come back against uh, the authorities, and uh, indeed they do not have the checks and balances of Western modes of governance. Uh, that does not mean that they are free to govern as they will. It does not mean that those in authority have the power which we presume we would have if we didn't have to stand for elections and things of that kind. And he here is a Western stereotype of Chinese governance. Uh, I think you recognize this comes from the Simpsons cartoon. It's your children and grandchildren that watch it, even if you don't. Uh, the, the background here is from a Chinese poster. 
Uh, we have the three representatives of the People's Liberation Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army. And there are some, uh, the, the factories arrayed behind, and the robotic soldiers uh, in the front lower right, uh, implying that that's the way the Chinese function, uh, only r robotically following the orders that are given from above. And of course, Homer Simpson is gagged here, can't possibly express himself, and that looks bad. He's being marched off to prison, I think. Well, right, perhaps. Right, right. Uh, it's it's the, the Western stereotype of the Cold War vision of China. Here, on the other hand, is a vision in the other direction, uh, which is, whoop, well, damn. Go back along. Which has plenty of problems of its own. Of course, you recognize this is focused on American politics, the symbols of the two major parties battering each other, uh, neither giving up, neither making progress, and governance as a process uh, ceases to function adequately under those conditions. So if you were speaking to a Chinese audience, this would be a perfect example of why China should not attempt to move in any Western democratic direction, because this is what is likely to happen. Now, the next, next no. slide is really a question of, if you move into the Chinese world, what kind of an image would you select to represent governance as it works in China? We selected a very controversial image, and it's been controversial ever since it arrived, uh, by Hong mm -hmm. Yong Yu. Some of you will know this. Uh, the Chinese here is a very familiar um, uh, saying to anyone in China, uh, Zhang Yi Zhe Yang, uh, Bi Yi Yang, which means one eye open, one eye closed. I'm sure that we in Ireland recognize this. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, it is only the wink, you know, whether he's winking or whether, in fact, this was shown to Mao, this came out near the end of the Cultural Revolution, it was highly controversial. Is this a critique? Everything in art is regarded as con uh, political. I mean, there's no separate political sphere, you know. And in fact, the owl image goes back to the Book of Odes, the song, uh, Book of Songs, which is extremely ancient. Confucius cites it. Um, and uh, it, it was taken as political then, because you know, the owl is a raptor, you know. And oh, this was shown to uh, Mao, uh, who everyone was prepared to go out and, you know, imprison the people, the artists in particular. And Mao looked at and shrugged his shoulders and said, everyone knows that owls sleep with one eye open, one eye closed. And in fact, he's right. Owls do sleep with one eye open, one eye closed, because half their brain is still awake. Because they're not only raptors, but they, have, they are also wrapped. I mean, they're also hunted. Um, now, why is this an important image if you want to look at uh, the cultural debate in China? It partly has to do with the way that the systems work or don't work, and we, as I say, are quite familiar with the way. The owl is a metaphor, clearly, and it's how to preserve face. If you're very concerned, a central concern in all dealings with China is preserving the other person's face or respect. Why is that? <clears throat> the only self you have in this world is face. And what is face is not the image you construct for yourself. It's the image that others give you. It is the respect that others give you. You are judged by how you are greeted, how you're received, how much attention is paid to you. If you don't get that, you do not exist. It's a kind of social suicide not to have face. Um, and uh, the saying is a person without face in China is like a, a tree without bark. Well, the tree still stands, but without bark, the tree would die. Everyone who knows about trees knows that. Um, so this is one eye open in the publicly visible events, which you can't deny, but one eye closed to whatever interferes with the appearances to avoid conflict and trouble. And it's often ambiguous situations where you have a choice. Let me give you an example. When we lecture together... It's a good thing because I can keep my eyes open when John Blair is talking to the audience and they being students, of course, the phones come out, they start texting, or maybe the computer goes up, I caught one looking at friends. Now, there were very few, these being very attentive Chinese graduate students, but it does happen, right? Now, I have a chance when I stand up to speak to say, you, you and you, turn off your mobile phones, you know? Uh, if I do that, I lose face because it means I'm calling attention to people who are not paying respect to me, and therefore it becomes self-evident that some respect is not being shown to me, so I go down a bit. Whereas if I ignore it 
and catch them after class, you, <laughs> don't ever do that again, right? Or avoid, don't come to class. Um, so uh, this is the way one maintains a certain authority. We all know if we've been in positions of authority, either as parents or teachers or professional people, if there are certain occasions you just say, forget it, it's not worth calling, calling. Other occasions you think, I can't, I can't do that. Um, so that protecting not only yourself and your own appearance, but those others in your mian, your guanxi. Your guanxi are your networks, but they are your networks of people you trust and who are loyal to you. It begins with your family, where it's presumed, and moves outwards. Um, now, once guanxi is very important, you move around with this kind of mob, if you want. But an example of how guanxi loyalties work, this is a, a, a network of loyalties and trust, in other words, of exchange. In guanxi, you do something for someone, they do something for you. You're always very careful in China to pay back eventually. They're not as punctilious as Japanese in keeping count of what you owe them, but you do owe them. So if someone helps you out, you take them out to lunch, you always lead with gifts, everyone knows that when you go to China. Um, so there is a famous incident of Confucius in the Analects, uh, who is being visited in his village by the governor of Shu. The governor of Shu is very proud. He says, I come from the, you can't teach me anything about moral righteousness, Confucius. I come from the most moral village in the whole country. Right? And Confucius looks at him and says, really? And he says, yes, I'll show you how moral we are. If a father steals a sheep, his son will report him to the authorities. And Confucius is horrified. He says, what? He said, that would never happen in our village. In our village, the father covers for the son and the son for the, co- uh, for the father. Now, to us, that spells one eye open, one eye closed, or is it loyalty that leads to what we call corruption, which is, by the way, our corruption is not the same as other people's corruption, as you all know if you've done any business in China. You know, we have, we have a corrupt little society here. They have a corrupt big society there. What is corruption? <laughs> in this case, loyalty is the primary rule, that you are always loyal. Um, but for feigned compliance in, is necessary in what uh, pretends to be a top-down centralized system, which isn't really in control. Now, feigned, I mean strategical compliance. You make the gesture of compliance and go ahead and do what you want. You know, and every uh, Chinese person is very strategic in every decision they take. They are no understand how to game the system. It is not regarded as immoral. It's what you do in a rigid, top-down hierarchical system to get by. You know, um, and it involves a great deal of intelligence. That's why strategy is so highly developed in the Chinese uh, kind of tradition. People like Sun Tzu didn't come from nowhere. They came from a tradition in which the emperor's word was law and you had to learn how to work around it. It's a workaround, right? Um, so it isn't necessarily um, corruption. It is you make the gesture. Everyone understands the gesture and lets it go. And, uh, and, and that's very important in, the, in terms of governance. So we move on to a big issue, power in China. Power in China, of course, is not centralized, as you all know. First of all, it's so uncentralized that there is a dual system of governance in place. Not even our Chinese students knew about this. We managed to get a document that set this out. That is, every position of authority in China, everything, even in our university, has a shadow. We wouldn't even call it a shadow because it's a twin. And every state position has a party official. Every party official has a state person. They watch each other, they make decisions together, um, they are their checks and balances. So in our university, the vice dean, the dean, everyone, the president, uh, for instance, the uh, the party uh, secretary was there permanently in our university over the last 12 years. The presidents have changed three or four times. The party secretary is always the same. He and the president arrive at decisions about the university together. So it's actually a Leninist model, and it's unchanged since uh, some people would say unreformed, but it is unchanged, it clearly works. Also, power structures, that anyone who's worked in China knows this, are very diffuse. They're diffuse for many reasons. A lot of delegation to local authorities, it's very highly localized, which means that centralized mandates become spotty. Implementation becomes a difficulty. And how they're implemented is often left up to the authorities, and if the mandate from central power is ambiguous, (coughs) how do you follow it, you know? Also, um, influence. 
is a very important thing in Yon Guanchi. For instance, in the army, we know someone whose brother-in-law was a general in the PLF. He retired. That doesn't mean his influence is lessened. We're told once a commanding officer, always a commanding officer. So any important decisions are being made in his branch of the army in, in Shanghai. A phone call is made. What do you think about this? What should I say to the committee? So influence is very hard to track. What does this lead up to? The result is it's very hard to assign accountability for any decision made. First of all, it would be made by consensus with at least two people. Um, there are no clear lines of command. It's not a military structure. It's not robotic, as the Westerners think. It, in fact, is far more flexible and far more sophisticated and far more complicated. As everything gets in China very complicated very quickly, because you're not dealing with one person, you're dealing with Guanxi. You know, we're making a lot of decisions uh, behind your back. And uh, this is yeah. where we lead to how, then, do you govern such a country? <laughs> uh, at, at the very top of the People's Republic is the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Uh, there are now seven men. They are uh, presumed to disagree freely with each other, uh, but none of these debates ever surface. Uh, there is a decision made by some kind of consensus among the seven, and that establishes the position which is broadcast for everyone. It's only rare in recent decades when controversy on the level of the Standing Committee surfaces. The last time was in the Tiananmen incident of 1989, uh, which was so embarrassing to the authorities in China that they tried to cover it up ever since. Uh, so there is conflict, but we don't know what it is because it is, for reasons of face, uh, kept out of sight. Because if it were to become public, as it would in the West sooner or later, that would lead to the loss of face, the loss of credibility of the party as the governing structure, etc., etc. The whole edifice would be threatened. So criticism, overt criticism, is a very dangerous uh, and is, uh, is very often suppressed, long prison sentences uh, or, or whatever. So the governance in China, as it works, works through xin, heart-mind. The poor translators who go from Chinese to English have a problem, because in English there is no heart-mind word. A translator of this word has to use a mind word or a heart word, something about feelings or something about thoughts. Uh, this is true in all Western languages, because for centuries now we've presumed, we've believed in our weird way that you can separate your thinking processes from your feeling processes. Chinese don't believe that. It's, they're all connected. You can't think without feeling. You can't feel without thinking. That's what it means to be a human being. So governance then works through human nature in this way. The greatest fear is a feeling matter and a thinking matter too. It's luan, chaos. Uh, the most recent time of extreme chaos in luan was the great cultural revolution. Uh, no one we've met in China is interested in going back to that period. Whether they're on the governing side or the side of the governed, they say this was a terribly destructive because all of the structures we counted on to be, allow us to live were brought into question. So the mantra of government in that world is control, control, control. It doesn't have control, but it keeps insisting that it does. And it's only naive Westerners who believe that kind of statement. And the control, the attempts at control, are exerted through carrot and stick, both sides. Their promises of prosperity and stability, national greatness, space program, nine dash line in the South China Sea, many recent instances. Or threats, threats if you don't follow uh, the, the line established by the authorities, uh, there will be poverty, there will be instability, one. Uh, there will be punishment and shame for individuals who deviate too seriously, too visibly from the public line. So Xin becomes translated as the feelings of the Chinese people. Uh, as William Callahan, who spoke here some weeks ago, has written, uh, sometimes there are statements from the foreign ministry in China translated into English as, the feelings of the Chinese people are hurt by some Western diplomatic initiative. That sounds silly from the Western point of view because we don't think feelings are part of diplomatic uh, interactions. But in the Chinese world, because Xin is so central to the, the idea of human nature, the feelings are intimately connected with the reasoning processes uh, that go on. Uh, okay, so in negotiating with China in all kinds of levels, the West typically evokes first principles of physics. And I think you've heard metaphors like this, traction, leverage, pressure. 
Uh, these are Newtonian physics, which went out for the physicists centuries ago, but still seems dominant in Western thinking about how you manage the world. You try to have causes and effects and outcomes, uh, and it is, uh, it is hopeless as an approach to a complex world like China. It's not useful to analyze complex situation in terms of single causes or predictable outcomes, because there are many causes and there are multiple outcomes simultaneously at the same time. China instead evokes personal relations. The metaphors that they use are based on respect. Xiao and Mianza are the terms we've used mostly so far. The negotiations follow Guanxi networks. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question about Zhou Yongkang and Bo Xilai, we'll have time to uh, show how that works in, uh, in the networks of influence and hierarchies within the Chinese world. The one thing that the West and China have as a shared tradition, which is the greatest source of hope we see in the negotiations to come, is pragmatism. That is a common emphasis, not on ideology, not on abstract principles, which the Westerners tend to believe in, but nobody else tends to believe in them, uh, but rather concrete problems which maybe can be eased by negotiating some particular concrete, specific, non-abstract change in the way things are done. If we can be sufficiently pragmatic together, we have a chance of coping with the climate crisis. If we don't, we have no chance. And uh, the focus then is on we as human beings, not just we as Westerners, which is where we began. Uh, and we as human beings are now in the same boat. Uh, there's the boat, and you can see that the, it is, of course, a Western boat because it's weighed down by Western ideals and Western power structures. Denial of climate change, economic growth, PDF rises in PDF no matter what, despite the flaws in PDF. Uh, wealth, keep our wealth, uh, have uh, the greatest wealth here and not elsewhere. Uh, uh, the rights, as in human rights, very complex issue worth commenting on in consumerism. And all of these weighted, uh, the weight on all of these brings the end of the boat where most of the people are out of the water. But the man on top is saying, why don't you row? Otherwise, we're going to drown. And of course, this boat is not going to escape drown. So, so that's, we, we, that is where we end this because is we this end. is our this is our greatest preoccupation right now is how do we we need to understand China and the West we need to understand each other we have reached a critical point on this earth that if we don't the two biggest emitters are what U S and China here right now of C O two emissions uh, China has even overtaken the uh, EU now in terms of uh, per capita emissions. If we can't sit down and talk in concrete things about what's going to happen in the next 20 years, we are indeed, as a species, we are in for a very rough time. And that means our future and the future generations. Um, but we have to find common ground. And we find we cannot have common ground if we insist in our arrogant way on them doing it the Western way. Uh, we have to find a common human solidarity and I think that actually uh, the Chinese way of, of, of understanding this is a heart-mind issue. This isn't just a mind issue. Um, and it is a matter of one's heart-mind. It is a matter of one's posterity. And it is a matter um, you know, of using all the cultural resources we have in both civilizations to try to bring, and we do have a long pragmatic tradition, even America does, of actually sitting down and saying, this is the situation now, let's just... Let's just get on with seeing what common ground we have. <clears throat> so I'm sure you have a lot of questions because we have covered a lot of ground.